focus on the Lord Jesus. Um, over the holidays, um, I've uh, been at least a half a dozen times challenged uh, in the last week about my own personal walk with the Lord and how I, how much I need to um, to get close to Him. Uh, the Christmas season this year has been a real uh, refreshing time of um, meditation for me. And uh, Christmas Day we had borrowed some videos or been loaned some videos from Peggy Benwell, and um, they were uh, sermons by a black fellow by the name of Daryl. Um, somebody, I forget his name, Gidet or something like that, uh, that uh, goes to or used to go to Jerry Falwell School down in Lynchburg, Virginia. And uh, I was just really touched and challenged in my own personal life on some of the things that he had to preach about. This fellow was uh, uh, saved uh, and he was uh, a homeless person. He had no home. His mother, I think, had died. His father had abandoned them, and he lived under a bridge. And the only possession he had was a Bible. And he used to go to school every day and carry that Bible to school with him, and he'd read it when he got out of school in the afternoon, and he'd read it. That's the only thing he did is he read his Bible. And he got saved from reading that Bible, and uh, somehow Falwell find, found out about him and, and uh, got him... Uh, enrolled in the school and he's had a good education and uh, you talk about a heart for the Lord <laughs> that guy uh, I, I don't think I've ever listened to a preacher that touched me so much as that guy did it was amazing and it was a real challenge to me how much do I love the Lord uh, he really has a love for the Lord and uh, it's amazing how a, another person's testimony can touch you you know that's that's why it's so important that we who love the Lord this morning here in this place are willing to stand up and let our light shine, to be genuine about our faith and, and to be honest with ourselves in our walk with the Lord. And, uh, and I was really challenged and uh, wanting to uh, try to bring something this morning that would uh, sort of hold out to you that same uh, necessary thing that confronts each of us, that we need reality in our spiritual lives. We need uh, honesty before the Lord, any brokenness of spirit. Uh, when we stand before the Lord someday, there's going to be no room for hypocrisy. None of our barriers that have successfully, um, that we have successfully used down here in our relationships with other human beings, is going to work up there. He's going to strip it all away. It's just you and us, you and you, you and Him, uh, heart to heart, face to face, and. Uh, we're going to see him as he really is, and, and it's going to be true the other way around as well. So I challenge you this morning to focus on the importance of Jesus to you as an individual. I don't care whether you're saved this morning or whether you are. I mean, I care, but from the perspective of this message, this isn't just a gospel message trying to get somebody saved. If there is anyone here this morning who is not a believer, I trust that you will... Uh, in this last Lord's Day of 1990, make this the day of decision for you that you will wait no longer, that you will turn to Christ. But those of us who know Jesus as our personal Savior, we desperately need Him on a continuous day-by-day -day basis. If that is something that we don't realize, then perhaps uh, this message this morning will do so. Everybody knows that chocolate chip cookies without chocolate chips really aren't chocolate chip cookies. Yeah, I mean, that's what makes a chocolate chip cookie, right? My kids really don't like having chocolate chip cookies that don't have very many chocolate chips in them. They like the chocolate chips. You know, that's why they eat the, the cookies. And everybody knows that uh, water without the uh, oxygen in it isn't very tasty. It's probably deadly. I don't know my chemistry very well, but I think just plain old hydrogen is a little gaseous, isn't it? Uh, we need hydrogen and oxygen in just that precise amount to have the wonderful benefits of water. We can't live without water. And so is Christ to every individual life. That's a life without Christ is like a cookie without the chocolate chips. That's not very serious, but uh, it's deadly to have a life without Jesus Christ. Being the central focus, the animating factor, the one thing that is root 
and basic and foundational to all we do. Everything we think, everything we cherish and value, our relationships, our, uh, our hopes, our aspirations, everything that we want to be, Jesus is foundational to it. I want to stress that this morning. In our young people's class this morning, we were just doing an introductory study on Proverbs. And we were stressing the difference between knowledge and wisdom, between intellect and wisdom. And as we were stressing there, the real difference between the world's value or estimation of intelligence or wisdom and God's estimation of wisdom is that missing factor that you won't find in the world consistently, and that is morality. Education without morality is really not an education. You're just honing the tools for criminals to use in their, in their lives. And without morality, they haven't got an education. They haven't got real wisdom and understanding. And hence, we as parents need to make sure that our children grow up with God's morals as the governing factor, as the primary thing in their, in their minds that govern everything that they think and do and choose and, and will. Well, anyway, my proposition this morning is that Christ is central in importance to every individual for different reasons. I wanted to approach this, I'm not sure if I can even adequately uh, communicate this morning what I really wanted to say, but I oh, sort of wanted to tie it into the Christmas uh, season that we've just gone through and, uh, and to just try to show you that from just about any angle that you think of, Jesus is of central import importance. Look at the names that were given to Jesus just in the Christmas story. Turn to Matthew chapter 1. I'd like to show you this morning the centrality of Jesus from some of his names, from some of the prophecies that were made about him, from some of his own claims, and from the questions that he asked people during his ministry. I don't, I guess I would have to say that this is not going to be a very rigid, uh, this is a sermon without very rigid uh, homiletical form, but I would rather be devotional this morning anyway. That's the way I feel. The names of Jesus have a great deal to teach us about who he was and how important he was. We all know some of this stuff. This is not really... unfamiliar territory that I'm going to cover for a few moments. And by no means are these all of the names that we, are, that we find in the scriptures of Jesus. Uh, there are literally hundreds of names for Christ found in the scriptures, but there are at least a dozen found just in the, in the nativity narratives in Matthew and Luke that show us just how extraordinarily significant Jesus is to people regardless of what status in life they have. Matthew chapter 1, verse 1, the very first verse in the New Testament, is really telling us about where Jesus came from. This is his birth. The book, this is the book about the genealogy of Jesus Christ, the son of David, the son of Abraham. You'll notice that he's called Jesus Christ, the son of David. There's four names there. Jesus, Christ, son of David, son of Abraham, and every one of those names tells us something significant about the person Jesus Christ. Son of David refers to his royalty. Son of Abraham refers to his humanity. As the book of Hebrews says, Jesus Christ did not take angelic form when he came into the world 2,000 years ago. We all know that. He wasn't a mere spirit. But he was a human being. He had to be a human being. To do the things that the prophets predicted, he had to be human. And so the writer of Hebrews in chapter 2, verse 14, says he took upon himself the seed of Abraham so that through his own death that he could destroy the devil and deliver people, human beings, who through all their lifetime have been subject to bondage, to deal with our hum humanity's common problems Jesus Christ had to be a man. Matthew chapter 1, verse 21. When the angel spoke 
to Mary. She said, well, I guess the angel was speaking to Joseph here. And the angel said that Mary would bring forth a son and you shall call his name Jesus. Why? Because he would save his people from their sins. In Hebrew, uh, Savior is Yeshua. Yeshua. It comes from the, the verb Yasha, which means to save, to deliver. And so Jesus is the anglicized form of these words here. Jesus in the Greek, Yasha, Yeshua, Savior, the one who will save. That's the connection there. Think about that for a moment. You're familiar with it? Everybody's heard that word, Savior. We need a Savior. Someone that del will deliver us, help us. He shall save His people from their sins. Not just His people, but the whole world. Chapter 1, verse 23 a little bit further, before he was done, the angel said to Joseph, Behold, the virgin shall be with child and shall bring forth a son. They shall call his name Emmanuel, which being interpreted is God with us. Emmanuel in the Hebrew. With us is God. El is the word, short form for Elohim, for God. With us is God. What a significant phrase. Jesus is central. He's royalty. He's true humanity. He's the world savior. He's truly God. El Ohim. Chapter 2, verse 2. When the wise men came into Herod's Jerusalem, they asked that most provocative question, where is he that is born king of the Jews? We have seen his star in the east. He was born king of the Jews. He didn't just attain kingship of the Jews like Herod had through his manipulations and his murderous things. This man was a usurper. Uh, Jesus was born king. He had the right. He was royalty. Born king of the Jews. Um, I'd like to talk a little bit more about that. We will in the course of this morning because that particular title has great import for every one of us in this room. Those of us who have never seen Jesus face to face um, will someday find great solace and great comfort and great, great fulfillment in that wonderful fact about Jesus Christ that comes out in that name, King. King of the Jews. We'll, we'll see. We'll see that in a moment. Um, in chapter two, verse four, uh, I, I really like this because the the wise men were looking for the king of the Jews, and then Herod turns around and he automatically knows. Herod knows that the king of the Jews is none other than what is he called in verse four? He demanded of these religious leaders where Messiah where the Christ should be born. In Herod's mind, king of the Jews was equal to the Christ. Christ. In the Greek language, Christos is a word, it was like an adjective, like big. Right? Only it doesn't mean big, it means special. Special. Christos in the Greek language means special. The same word is used in the Old Testament, Mashiach, which means Messiah, anointed one. So to, in the Hebrew mentality, a special person was anointed. Whenever a king was anointed, like David was anointed by Samuel, remember? The Jews would always do this. They would pour oil on the guy's head. That, would, that was a sign to everybody observing that that was the special, most special person in the country. I mean, that, that person's special. Mashiach, anointed. And so... The Hebrew connotation of anointed one, especially anointed person who usually in the context of reigning or, or being a priest, is synonymous with the Greek idea of a special person, is synonymous with the Magi's expectation of a king. And then we go on even further, verse 6, uh, when these religious leaders were asked, where is the Messiah 
They turn to Micah, chapter 5, verse 2, and it says in verse 6 here, Thou Bethlehem, which is a quotation from Micah 5, 2, Thou Bethlehem in the land of Judah art not the least among the princes of Judah, for out of thee shall come a governor that shall rule my people Israel. Messiah, Christ, King of the Jews equals governor who will rule. A person with real authority, actual authority, not a titular figure, not a person like Queen Elizabeth is to us in Canada. She has no authority anymore, right? Ever since 1981 when uh, Prime Minister Trudeau got our own Canadian Constitution. She has a, no real authority in this country. Right? The Governor General still represents her, but it's all titular, it's all figured, right? The real authority lies in Parliament now. We can make our own laws. We're not tied to the apron strings of Britain. All right? And so Christ is no mere figurehead king like that, but he's an actual governor. Amazing concepts here. Christ... Do you think Christ is governing today? Well, the Bible says that he's seated on the right hand of the Father on high. He's ruling today. But 1 Corinthians chapter 15 puts it very plainly that not all things yet are subdued under his feet. His kingdom is spiritual yet. It's, he's, work, he's supposed to be head over us. He's supposed to be controlling our actions as his blood-bought children, as saints in the body of Christ. He's supposed to be governing my life and in your life. He wants to be Lord and Master. But no, we don't see Christ governing fully and finally like someday he will as King, King of the world, King of kings, Lord of lords, as we see in the last book of the Bible. Luke, chapter... Let's turn to Luke, chapter 1. The other nativity account of Christ. You can build a whole, almost a complete doctrine on the person and work of Jesus Christ just looking at his names. It shows us his great central importance. He's really man, truly God, the world's Savior, ruler, Messiah, King. Luke chapter 1 verse 32 tells us something rather interesting. The angel now is t speaking to Mary and, and, she's, and he says to Mary, you will conceive in your womb, verse 31. Bring forth a son. Call his name Jesus. She said, well, great shall be called the Son of the Highest. Son of the Highest. And the Lord God shall give to him the throne of his father David. And he shall reign over the house of Jacob forever. And of his kingdom there shall be no end. Son of the Highest. Uh, eternal king here. He shall be called the Son of the Highest. I want you to observe something that is sort of hard for us to understand. A lot of people think that Jesus Christ became the Son of God because he was born in Bethlehem. But Jesus Christ was the Son of God before he was ever born. Now for us, nobody ever becomes a son without first being born. <laughs> you know, and that's how you become a son, right? But the sonship relationship that Jesus has to his heavenly Father is unique. One of a kind, unlike any, anything human. It says that in Isaiah chapter 9, verse 6, Unto us a child is given, unto us a son is born. He was already a son and he was born. And the sort of is implied here in the angel's words to Mary that he shall be called the son of the highest. How, how is Jesus the son of God? Well, back in Psalm chapter 2, verse 7, which we'll look at a little bit later this morning, um, it says that uh, this day I will declare the decree. Um, I can't quote it. Should be able to quote it. Psalm 2, 7. I will declare the decree, Christ says. The Lord, the Father in heaven, has said unto me, You are my son. This day have I begotten thee. And Jesus refers to that as the decree, it's an eternal decree, it's a decision about the working relationship between the members of the triune Godhead, Father, Son, and Spirit. And the Father, there was a decree made, not in time, but before time, revealed in time, that Jesus would always be Son of God. And so, the Son of God was born the Son of God. And uh, He would be called the Son of the Highest. 
uh, very unique things about Jesus Christ that we, we see here. Eternal sonship. Verse 35. Mary was astonished. And the angel said in reply to her question, The Holy Spirit shall come upon you. The power of the highest shall overshadow you. Therefore also that holy thing which shall be born of thee shall be called the Son of God. Holy thing, the Son of God. Unlike people in some respects. Not merely a mortal, not merely human, but the Son of God. In chapter 1, verse 43, uh, some short while later, Mary left her home in Nazareth and went south to Judah, probably close to Bethlehem. This is months before Jesus was ever born, and she visited her cousin Elizabeth. And Elizabeth uh, uh, was filled with the Holy Spirit, it says in verse 41, and, and uh, the Holy Spirit caused her to speak out a blessing of greeting to Mary. And Elizabeth says in verse 43, Why is this granted to me that the mother of my Lord should come to me? The centrality of Christ. Uh, Elizabeth was uniquely shown that the babe in Mary's womb, that no one else but Mary knew at this instant that she was carrying was actually my Lord, a term reserved for Yahweh in the Old Testament. Lord, Jehovah, one and the same thing. Blasphemy for a Jew to say something like that. Jehovah was an invisible God. No man could be Jehovah in the popular Jewish thinking, erroneously. And yet, Elizabeth says, my Lord. And so Jesus was her Lord. Chapter 2, verse 26. When the baby was brought into the temple, Simeon, it says in verse 26 that it was revealed by the Holy Spirit to Simeon that he should not see death before he should had seen the Lord's Christ. The Lord's Christ. Another, another title for Christ. Uh, every involved character in the Christmas story had some significant relationship to Jesus Christ. Uh, the Lord's Christ, Jehovah's Messiah, Jehovah's significant one, the anointed one. He calls him thy salvation in verse 30. Verse 32, uh, Simeon calls Christ a light to lighten the Gentiles and the glory of thy people. Jesus is the glory of Israel. How is Christ the glory of Israel? You and I have never seen that. The Jews killed him. They, they spit on him. They pulled his hair out. They, they mocked him. They threw him on a cross. They ridiculed him. They totally rejected him. How was Christ the glory of Israel? That is yet a future thing. It hasn't been yet revealed. Nobody has yet seen the glory of Christ outside of Peter, James, and John and the Mount of Transfiguration. And even that event in Matthew chapter 17 was a prefigure. It was, a, it was just a glimpse like that of, of Christ and his kingdom when he was going to be showing forth his glory. And so the names of Jesus Christ, even the nativity narratives, show us that Christ is of central importance to each of us. He's not just a Jew for Jews, but he's the Savior of all men. And uh, he is uniquely qualified to be the Savior, being both God, having God's ability to save, and man having the ability to go between God and man, representing men. Someday he will rule. Presently he's the Messiah, the eternal Son. Fruitful fields for speculation. I want to talk a little bit about the centrality of Christ according to the prophecies and types of scriptures for a few moments. Please go back to Genesis chapter 12, the first book in the Bible, Genesis chapter 12. I just want to look at six prophecies briefly. Genesis chapter 12, verse 3. These prophecies from beginning to end show us the great significance of Jesus Christ. Do you realize that, for example, Jehovah's Witnesses 
have completely missed the point of the whole Bible. Diligently knocking on people's doors, preaching the gospel of the kingdom. But they leave out Christ. Not that they won't use Christ's name or refer to his name or even say that he's important or they won't, they won't say that he didn't die for you. But the real significance of, of Scripture is all to point to Christ. If Jesus Christ is deleted or de devalued or in any way brought to secondary importance in the message of Scripture, then he is whoever it is that has exalted some other message above Christ is missing the point. Even our salvation is secondary to the message of Christ. Christ came to the world, into the world not merely to be our Savior, but to be the glory of Israel. You and I have no idea, very little idea of what that's going to be like. Because it's important to God, not just that some people be saved. If, it, if that was the prime reason for the Bible, to bring men the message of salvation so that people would be saved, then what, what is God doing not saving some people? You ever think about that? If, if salvation of people was the number one motive of God in, as revealed in Scripture, then why are some people not saved? So it's obvious that, that God has other reasons, higher priorities. And of course, the exaltation of His Son, Jesus Christ, is, is the ultimate explanation, the glory of Israel. God wants everyone to see, you know. If you don't voluntarily bow your knee this morning, to Jesus Christ. Someday you will be on your bruised and bloody knees saying, yes, now I believe that you are Lord. <laughs> Philippians chapter 2 says, every knee will bow by rule of force and declare that Jesus is Lord. Well, the, the prophecies of Scripture are, are, are no better way to show the centrality of Christ, of His importance to me and to God and to everything that God is doing in history, because Christ is central to just about everything. Genesis 12, 3, God said to Abraham, I will bless them that bless thee, curse him that curses thee, and in thee, Abraham, shall all families of the earth be blessed. What do you mean this is a prediction of Christ? Well, Peter took it as a prediction of Christ. Acts chapter 3, verses 25 and 26. You want to quickly hold your finger here and go there. Acts chapter 3, verses 25 and 26. Actually, I'll read 24 through 26. This is Peter preaching. I believe it was the day after Pentecost. And he said, Yea, all the prophets from Samuel and those who follow after, as many as have spoken, have likewise foretold of these days, ye are the sons of the prophets and of the covenant which God made with our fathers, saying to Abraham, and in your seed, Abraham, Genesis 12, 3, shall all the kindreds of the earth be blessed, and now Peter applies it. He says, To you first, God having raised up his son Jesus, sent him to bless you in turning away every one of you from his sins. Jesus bringing salvation is the fulfillment of this wonderful blessing. And it's a universal blessing. Everybody in the whole world, whether saved ultimately or not, is going to be is blessed. All families of the earth are blessed. Not all individuals of the earth but all families of the earth are blessed through Jesus Christ. Exodus chapter 12 is another example of Christ being central to the plan and the program of God. Exodus 12, verses 11 to 13. Some of you may remember that this is, the 12th chapter of Exodus is the story or record of Israel's deliverance from Egypt. And that night, God instructed them to kill a lamb. Thus shall you eat it, verse 11, with your loins girded, your shoes on your feet, your staff in your hand, and you shall eat it in haste. It is the Lord's Passover. I will pass through the land of Egypt this night. I will smite all the firstborn in the land of Egypt, both man and beast, and against all the gods of Egypt I will execute judgment. I am the Lord, and the blood shall be to you for a token upon the houses where you are. And the next phrase could be taken as universally applicable to every person in time. 
right now in Goodly River, God says, and when I see the blood, I will pass over you. That's not talking just about the Passover lamb, you know, 3,400 years ago in the days of Moses. God today says, when I see the blood, I will pass over you. And of course, 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 6 says, Jesus Christ, our Passover is offered for us. It actually calls Jesus our Passover. He's the Passover lamb. 1 Peter 1, 18 and 19, Jesus Christ is the lamb slain before the foundation of the world. And in heaven, it's significant in the book of Revelation when, that Jesus is generally referred to as the Lamb in the last book of the Bible. In the future, when we stand before the throne, when we worship Christ, the, the thing of greatest importance to you and to me will be, have been the fact that Jesus was Lamb for us. Not just Lord, but Lamb. Right? When I see the blood, I will pass over you. The blood has been shed once in eternity, and we have been benefited. Leviticus chapter 16, verse 32 and 33. Those of you who know anything about Leviticus know that the 16th chapter of Leviticus focuses on the most si single most important day of the Jewish religious calendar. Exodus 12 is the day of redemption, day of deliverance. Leviticus 16 is the day of atonement. And on the day of atonement, you should know that that was the one day that the high priest could go into the innermost sanctuary, the presence of God, and the, where God dwelt between the cherubim and the Ark of the Covenant, and the high priest would go in there once a year, the high priest only, to offer up blood for another year so God would forgive his people when they brought animal sacrifices. Verses 32 and 33, The priest whom he shall anoint and whom he shall consecrate to minister in the priest's office in his father's stead, shall make the atonement, and shall put on the linen clothes, even the holy garments, and he shall make an atonement for the holy sanctuary. He shall make an atonement for the tabernacle of the congregation and for the altar. And he shall make an atonement for the priests and for all the people of the congregation. That was the great value of the Day of Atonement. The priest could make an atonement. No one else could make an atonement, just the high priest. And anybody that knows anything about the Bible knows that the great unifying theme is the lamb was predicted, the priest that would offer the lamb was predicted, the sacrificial ceremony, the procedure was predicted, and Jesus Christ was the fulfillment of all of that. He was lamb, he was priest, he, was, he offered himself, right? Hebrews chapter 10, God was not satisfied with the offerings of bulls and goats. And they, those, those animal sacrifices couldn't remove sin permanently. It was always remembrance, yearly, on the Day of Atonement made. And so Jesus Christ came and offered himself once for sin. And after that, sat down. Aren't you glad? Jesus Christ is of central importance. You know, Jesus Christ's blood today still flows for you. Now, don't take me literally, but it says in 1 John 1, 7, the blood of Jesus Christ continually cleanses us from all of our sins. I don't know, I, I'm not sure I can explain that. My, my best shot at it would be that the finished work of Christ 2,000 years ago is as if he was continually doing it. It is that efficacious. God sees it as continually applicable to your case and to my case. And every time I think a lustful thought, every time I get angry enough to kill, any time I mouth off or repeat a piece of gossip, anytime I sin, the blood of Jesus Christ continually cleanses me from sin. And that cleansing is applicable and applied when I confess my sin. God is faithful and just to forgive me my sin and to cleanse me from all my sin. Are you glad? Is Jesus Christ important to you as a Christian? You'd better believe it. Without Christ, we have nothing. No hope. We haven't got time to look at Deuteronomy 18, verses 15 to 19. God says, I will raise up unto you a prophet. I will put my words in his mouth. One day Jesus was on his way north from Jerusalem. He took the uh, odd route home and went through Samaria. He stopped and sat down beside Jacob's well. He met a, a woman of questionable moral character, very questionable. And he proceeded to 
reveal to her the innermost secrets of her hidden life. Having never met her, and she realized that this person was unique among men. John chapter 4, you read it. She said, you must be a prophet. <laughs> and Jesus said, you're right, I am. She said, I know that when the Messiah comes, there's one identifying characteristic of the Messiah. God's anointed. He will tell us all things. And Jesus had just done that precise thing for that woman. He told her everything about her hidden sex life, her marriages, all her problems. And it convinced her. Jesus said, he claimed, I am God's prophet, the one who reveals. If you want to find out anything you need to know about life, who are you going to talk to? Teenagers, we were talking about this this morning. You're going to take God at His word or try it yourself. It's kind of stupid to to go over as a mature person and put your finger on the element on the stove, red hot element, just to see if it's hot. I don't believe what anybody says. I got to find try it out for myself. That's kind of stupid, right? Yeah, sooner or later, we have to learn to take other people's advice. God has spoken. God, who at sundry times and in diverse manners spoke to the fathers by the prophets, has in these last days spoken to us by His Son. In Jesus, we find everything we really need to know. Not everything that can be known, but everything we need to be known. And uh, the Scriptures really focus on the person of Christ. In Christ, I, I'll, I'll be able to figure out how to live, how to handle my money, how to marry right, how to... How to handle sorrow, how to handle trauma, how to handle pain, <coughs> everything. In Christ, I have the answer. Second Samuel 7, verses 12 to 17, another great prediction. God said to David one day, I will set up your, your seed after you. I will be his father. He will be my son. His kingdom will be forever. That hasn't quite happened yet. A lot of people believe that that's all been fulfilled. Jesus is now sitting at David's throne in heaven. I don't believe it. I believe he's sitting on David's throne in heaven. But I still believe that Jesus Christ is going to live and rule and reign in this world physically someday. He's going to have an earthly kingdom. He's, we're going to see someday a kingdom in which dwelleth righteousness. Jesus Christ is important to you and to me because someday we're going to reign with him, it says in Revelation. We're going to reign with him. The story isn't finished. You know, if all of life was compacted into one great big book this morning, it was sitting on this shelf, we're on page 395 and there's still several hundred pages to go. It's not over. The story's not done. Christ fulfilled a great deal when he came into the world the first time. But the scriptures predict a second coming. A coming in great power and glory. A coming with Ten thousands of his saints, of his holy ones. The, the nations are going to weep and wail and mourn when they see him whom they have pierced. Of course, we won't be mourning. Yes. I'm looking forward to seeing the Lord. This morning I wanted to uh, talk about some of Jesus' claims. I'm, I'm not going to elaborate. I'm going to read three of them out of a dozen or so that I collected some of them just from the book of John. I didn't even get halfway through the book of John. Showing us the great significance and importance of Jesus Christ to us. Jesus said, here's a claim that Jesus made, you must be born again. He claimed that you must be born again. He also claimed the Son of Man must be lifted up, that whosoever believes in him should not perish. Did you choose to be born into this world? Somebody turned 40 this week. Who was it? <laughs> Somebody around here turned 40. I was just... Well, anyway. 40 years ago, that person was born. They had nothing to do with it. They were just the object of someone else's desires, right? right? I mean, it's not that we don't have nothing to do with it. The baby comes through the birth canal. They participate in the birth, but they don't choose the time of their birth. They don't choose the, 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 qu the fact of their birth. Right? They don't choose anything. Right? Birth is somebody else's. Your birth is somebody else's business. Right? You must be born again. God must work in your life. If you're going to be saved as a sovereign act of God, He has to work in your life. You can't do it yourself. Right? But, 
The other side is, you must believe. The Son of Man must be lifted up so people can believe in Him. Now there's your response. That's also a necessity. Divine sovereignty on the one hand, He controls who gets born, but nobody gets born who doesn't believe. You must believe. Right? Jesus claimed those realities. Here's another one. I am the bread of life, Jesus said. He that comes to me shall never hunger. He claimed that. Among thousands of other things. I am the bread of life. He that comes to me shall never hunger. He that believeth in me shall never thirst. Are your deepest desires satisfied this morning? Let me ask you. You may be a Christian. But I believe it's quite possible for Christians to be very unsatisfied people. Because they're seeking satisfaction and contentment outside of Christ. As Paul says in Colossians, chapter, I think it's chapter 3, he says, If you then be risen with Christ, seek those things which are above. Set your minds on things above, not on things of the earth. For when Christ, who is our life, shall appear, then we shall appear with him in glory. Christ is our life. We live and move and everything about our life focuses on Christ. We can just get a glimpse of this. We'll be whole people. Satisfaction and contentment does not depend on me getting this relationship fixed or getting this amount of money or getting that job appointment or whatever. If you've got Christ, if you really enter into the reality of that, you can be satisfied in any circumstance. No matter how normally broken or scarred or difficult or or whatever in Christ. Christ is our life. Jesus said in John chapter 10 verse 10, do you, claim, do you believe this claim? He says, I am come that they might have life and that they might have it more abundantly. If, if I said no, no other thing this morning about the unique, significant and importance of Jesus Christ to all of us, it's this would be good enough. I could have preached my whole message on this one. I am come that they might have life. Do you have life this morning? He that hath the Son hath life. He that hath not the Son of God has not life. But let me ask you another question. Do you have life more abundantly? Just how fulfilled and happy are you? How useful and productive are you? Am I? I ask myself the same question. I, I'm subject to the same condition. Jesus said that he came that we might have not just eternal life, but life more abundantly. I believe that talking about here. Eternal life stretches from death onward for its experience. Right now, we, have, we, we now possess eternal life, but uh, what about the abundancy aspect? Sometime I'll preach a message on the questions Jesus asked. You'll be surprised at what you can learn from the questions that Jesus asked in his life. He was omniscient. He knew all things. So why did he ask questions? You ever think about that? Why did Jesus ask questions? It wasn't to find out information. It was to draw things to the surface of the people that heard the question. That they would realize something. And Jesus wants us to realize an awful lot of things because he asked a lot of questions during his life. Jesus is important. Uh, I'll close by reading a neat little poem that I found in the front of this uh, calendar that somebody gave me for Christmas. God knew our greatest need. If our greatest need had been information, God would have sent us an educator. If our greatest need had been technology, God would have sent us a scientist. If our greatest need had been money, God would have sent us an economist. If our greatest need had been pleasure, God would have sent us an entertainer. But our greatest need was forgiveness, so God sent us a Savior. And we as Christians, those of us who are already saved from sin and from the eternal consequences of hell, need our Savior every day just as much as we ever needed him before we trusted Christ. We need salvation from the power of sin, from the allurements of the world. From our own flesh, we need deliverance. And Jesus is the answer. At the end of 1990, I hope that in the quietness of your heart this morning that you'll just stop and reflect and maybe confess to the Lord that you've been uh, taking him a little bit too much for granted. 
If you're not a Christian, why not make this the time when you turn to Jesus as your Savior? Lord, 